three. Um, <clears throat> yes, we've got part two of Neil Peart on House of Strongbow. Um, so yeah, let's just go. Your performance in the Buddy Rich stuff that you... you oh, uh, well... How could I not be? Uh, you <laughs> what know? are you talking about? And, and even Buddy himself said, look, yeah. I've never been totally satisfied with anything I've ever done, but I keep trying. Right. And uh, f for me, it was that kind. Yeah, it was tremendously difficult. To so for, for you then, for a guy who everybody talks about in these glowing terms of you, you know, in that group of people who are the greatest of all time at what you do, w do you go through that, that personal moment where you think, oh, something isn't clicking, something isn't right? Well, of course. I mean, yeah. like, like I said, uh, if anyone's the master of drumming, Buddy Rich, and that was his analysis. Yeah. Never been satisfied with anything he's ever done. Pure, you know, but, but that could also done. just mean you just don't enjoy. Oh, no. <laughs> and I'm saying I look back with, with kind of affection now. Right. And even our earlier blundering uh, work when we were experimenting crudely and, and learning um, to play our instruments, learning to write songs, learning to arrange songs. These are schools of study. You know, you don't just know them. Nobody just knows them. Uh. And I get a patient with, uh, impatient about that with prose writing, too, right? Somebody goes, oh, I think I'll write a book. Really? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, it's not, nothing can be undertaken that lightly. No amount of talent can make up for what the knowledge of, of how to do it. Was it. You were saying that the art is not in the writing, but it's essentially in the revision. Like, that's the real well, difference. Uh, not, well, different authors. Were, I, I loved um, George Saunders, a, a very modern experimental in, in experimenter in, in short fiction. And he was asked about all the casual writing that fills our world and our ether right now. What's the difference between that and literary writing? And he said one word, revision. Right. Yeah, and you go back, and the, the same with my stories. Yeah, I, st I start out by scribbling notes in a, in a notebook and writing down things I want to remember, but later, <laughs> as you know, I want to find all that and learn about the, uh, the history of it, try to weave that history into a way that's entertaining. If I'm going to describe a landscape, oh my, it's like a painter painting it, you know, what, what it takes to imagine what the reader needs to know first. That's what I learned from the, uh, the Elements of Style as the old time handbook, of course. Strunk and White, and one of their major rules that I learned from it, well, yeah, okay, uh, there's a reader, I want him to feel the weather, I want her to see the sky. I want him to feel the emotion that I feel about this place, the magic that it has or doesn't. Well, that's beyond prose. That's also lyrics. That's songs. That's yeah, everything. Yeah, right? it, it is, but it's the craft of it. And uh, so I, I know that I have gotten better by design and all those things. And about drumming, um, you know, I progressed on a certain um, self perpetuated line but it, it certainly didn't mean I know everything mm -hmm. and I started in the rock era as a rock drummer so uh, to go back to the swing era and a big band style drumming is a whole and my teacher would have it's a whole other thing and <laughs> and certainly it is and it's so worthwhile though to um, face the challenge of going back to it and I, I studied with um, um, teachers I still study with teachers now because that's what it takes if you're going to be among the good ones, you know, I'm not, no one's going to use the best, even, for, even Buddy Rich wouldn't use the best. Right. But if you want to be among the good ones, then it's incumbent on you. Yes, the world has allowed you this profession too, okay, let's break it right down. If the world's going to allow you to hit things with sticks for a living, you ought to work at it. Yeah. Right, and so the, to me, the the teaching was um, an important part of that all along. I've had the three major teachers since I started, and Peter Erskine as recently as a few years ago, whose teaching I'm still learning from. His predecessor, Freddie Gruber, whose teacher teaching I'm still benefiting from, and the whole going into swing drumming. No, I didn't know everything about it, you know, and no, it didn't come natural to me. But I worked at it, worked at it, and uh, when I did the the most recent tribute concert, I chose a song, "Love for Sale." that uh, when I produced the tribute album in the early 90s, Steve Gadd had played on mm -hmm. so beautifully. It was absolutely my favorite piece of work. So where do I set my goal? My Pretty favorite, high. you know, so that became it. So I, when I studied with, um, with Peter Erskine that year, it was all toward performing that song and all the things that I needed to learn and all the things that I could learn along the way. And the simple <laughs> dedication to learning gave me a whole other gift that I didn't sign up and pay for or practice for. And it was a new understanding of time that gave me an, an improvisational ability that I had never had, mm -hmm. ever, and always wanted. And I was, there's two kinds of drummers or musicians you can be, really, compositional or improvisational. Mm -hmm. I was always um, compositional and happy about that. And all my best known drum fat parts are very carefully composed intricate element by intricate element, but that's fine, but I didn't want, you know, I, I wanted more, so uh, through that 
process I described, then I was given access to the world of improvisation. Could we imagine a time where you take some of your early records and you just re-record the drum parts for them? Another uh, you know, way I could do it? You know, it sounds silly, but of course we've discussed that because over time, um, circumstances affect things so much and there are certain songs that we believed in. Here's a good um, example of, of the Rush way of doing things. We've never given up on a song. We do not have a single unreleased, unreleased song in the world. Seriously? No, ever. Because <laughs> if we went far enough, we <laughs> believed in it, right? We kept, we, we kept working on it. A lot of stuff got thrown away before it got that far. Right. Or, or um, siphoned into other songs. I, I'll, I call my lyrical um, file the scrap file. You know, and I go when I'm looking for bits and pieces, and and musically we're the same. If things not happening, we throw it away. There's one song on the on Clockwork Angels that was, um, um, wish them well. Mm -hmm. Three times we wrote that song and threw it away, and, and and it was the third version finally that pleased us all. So um, all the way along, it, it took that the will was only fed by the inspiration to we believe in this song. But inevitably, when you get to the recording stage and the mixing stage, it might not be you know, what you envision. So we, we all have uh, those certain songs that, oh, I, I believed in that song, I thought it would be more. And uh, here's a good characteristic thing too in terms of mixing. Uh, mixing is always the end of waiting for me because I, when we first make a good demo, I'm done. You know, okay, <laughs> that's what I wanted. That's perfect. I could live with everything else. Or Getty's very meticulous, right. you know, and he calls mixing the death of hope. <laughs> so th that's ex so when you get to that stage in a song, you know, where you believed in it and it didn't quite reach the. Wh um, what is mixing to Alex? Um, Alex is a more spontaneous individual all the way, yeah. and yeah, and, uh, again, he would be a lot quicker about it, I think. And uh, all of his performances are spontaneous. You know, if he learns a, a rhythm part for a song and all that, that might be done in a more methodical style, but his solos, he just whips. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and that is his nature and the gift to it. I think you can, can be hear there. And, sure. um, Getty and I are, are meticulous about working and about working together and all that in an arrangement, where Alex will be sitting there fiddling with a guitar and go, what was that? Oh, I don't know. You know, it just really is, <laughs> and that's why when, when the two of them, for instance, we divide up perfectly because if I'm working on uh, lyrics, Getty and Alex working on music, and that's what they do. Getty just knows he just turns on the recorder, they start playing, and then later he siphons out the bits of genius that, that Alex has thrown off literally along the way. So that's part of the chemistry too. And those melodies, none of that stuff, or th those things ever pop into your head when you're writing? You, you've, you've been successful at separating those two parts of your brain? Uh, when I'm riding yeah. on the motorcycle? Yeah. Well, music is always playing, but um, I have no control over what it is or it bothers. I might spend the whole day trying to remember the lyrics of one old song, you know. Just but, but none of them are yours. Like, you don't, you don't get off the bike one day and say, I think ah, I have a lyric for a No, new, a new it's rush not tune. a creative endeavor. There's such a matter of will and focus and concentration. And that to me is the opposite of creative thought. Let's you know, talk about that word will, because isn't what this is all about really in this life? I think uh, it's so much what it takes, not just to accomplish anything, to but, but to resist all the other stuff, right? <laughs> you have two paths, and, and especially if you're in the arts world, and especially if you've been in the arts world in the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, there's not only been a lot to accomplish, but a lot to resist too. Yeah. So uh, yeah, absolutely, Will is a part of that, and um, a, a reason I was saying before by why a lot of artists surrender you know, to demons and, and temptation because they lack the will to resist it, and it's, it's a tragic thing. Again, so much, so much, trash <laughs> is talked about people and and god there's um, I, s I see stories in passing about some actress that's obviously mentally ill and people keep tormenting her and chasing around us right. what's wrong with people can't you see that and even some some old sports team owner that started spouting off nonsense because he's demented right you know and somebody betrayed him and they're they're portraying all this stuff in public and and if anyone knows someone who's gone through that and the the humiliation of it for the person and for their family. Should that really be of public concern? Mental illness of any kind, is that a joke? Well, it, it, it is uh, the modern Christians in the lion's den. It is the modern Colosseum with the Romans, right? Which <laughs> is everybody that gathers around to watch somebody pay for it. Yeah, I don't like it. Oh, it's terrible. <laughs> 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 but uh, perhaps it's just one of those parts of us as humanity, in, or in humans, right? And, and possibly will evolve it. And, and there, I, I picked up a germ of hope from you. <laughs> just because we used to do that kind of stuff, right? Mm -hmm. And and uh, and thankfully, I guess our um, our arena of public spectacle isn't quite so gory and sadistic now. And perhaps that's evolved. And we talked a little bit earlier about civil rights. Yes, there's far to go, but man, consider it 50 and 60 years ago. Right. What people went through, and and just imagine some uh, like um, here's another good song coming up for you, um, Sammy Davis Jr. Um, playing in San uh, playing in Las Vegas, not being able to stay in the hotel where he's singing. And, but there's a great album made together in 66 of uh, 
um, Sammy Davis singing and Buddy Rich's band playing. I think if you can find a song from that, oh, we can you find it. play one. I think I have it on my hard drive, actually. <laughs> I think we can. Uh, thank you so much for spending the time with us. Do, give me, and the people listening, three roads we can't miss that we have to ride. Oh, huh, that's the you know, things I don't ever think about, but um, I, I'm going to go take a little bigger three geographic experiences with that's roads going through them. Better, yes. How about that? I like that. Okay. Well, mountains are, of course, about the biggest geographical attraction. I'm going to pick the Sierras uh, from Yosemite, uh, the Tioga Pass, going okay. east over the Sierras from Yosemite. What's the right song to play for that? Uh, I, you shouldn't play a song. You should be riding that bike. Well, when we, on, this, <laughs> on this radio show, <laughs> what, should we play? <laughs> what does it feel like? Can you think about yeah, it? Yeah, that's, that's majesty. And I, I'm trying to describe actually Western landscapes, not to get off too far, in, but I, I come to musical metaphors like that. And when I first stood in front of the Grand Canyon, for example, it was a power chord. Yeah. It just brushed me back like ching. And um, the, uh, Utah, the rock formations there just remind me of classical. I would look at one of them and say, oh, Mahler. Yeah. You know, uh, they just have that kind of um, grandeur and and can be emotional impact the light seems to radiate out of them later in the day so I'm gonna say Utah too and just in general to travel south to north through the national parks of Utah mm -hmm. that's easy and then um, I'm a big fan of uh, uh, deserts yeah see those are two kind of mountainous ones I've got to send you across the Mojave mm -hmm. um, yeah I've got, uh, traveling uh, northeast from uh, Palm Springs through Joshua Tree National Park, and then up to Old Route 66, mm -hmm. and up through Death Valley into Nevada. I think if you did those three r rides, that might be a bucket list. And if you ever have an occasion to stop at 29 Palms, there's a rib shack just to the west of the entrance to Joshua Tree, which I don't eat the ribs anymore, but when I did, it was almost worth living just for that. Oh, Arkansas is for ribs, but that's another conversation. <laughs> Good to see you, sir. Thanks for your My time. My pleasure. Right on. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, well, I was going to say there's something. <coughs> Let's see. Um, yeah, I liked his thing, his take on uh, like the riding a motorbike or driving focus it takes to ride a bike is the opposite to what mood you want to be in to be creative. I think that's so true because... I don't think you can be rigid about creativity. Like you can't be, um, it isn't something that you just, you can get up and do day in, day out. You kind of, yeah. It's almost as well when you tend to not be thinking of things, things pop in your head better in terms of creative when you're not thinking I need to come up with this or I need to come up with that yeah I thought that was very interesting take and it's just kind of made me want to ride a motorbike I'm not gonna lie <clears throat> I'd love to do that I've always wanted to ride a motorbike across America mainly because of your big long straight roads that you have like I don't think in the UK well maybe actually saying that in the UK if you get out of like round here and near London or near cities, then it gets very country. But then a lot of them roads are like narrow and winding. But like Route 66 is just a straight line, isn't it? Then you have a lot of straight lines over there. It's just imagine that. Imagine opening a bike up on that. Mm. But yeah, anyway, that's the reaction. Sweet. <laughs>